6th of July uh, uh, in this year of 2020. Uh, welcome as well to everybody that's watching this at home on the Zoom platform, and I'd like to welcome also those who will watch it after a while on our church website and also the DVDs as well. You're all very, very welcome this morning. Welcome as well to our boys and girls. It's always lovely to see the children out and about. We very much appreciate you guys. You bring a whole spice of life to church, and we very much appreciate that today. Uh, we're going to uh, commence the opening of our service with, our, uh, with just a short Bible reading. I nearly said with our first hymn. There won't be any singing again this morning, I'm afraid. And uh, we look forward to that time when we'll be able to stand up and just really let go and raise the roof with a beautiful hymn or two. And so just something to begin to temper our, our, our thoughts and our minds as we think about the Lord this morning as we approach him today. And so just a few verses from the 121st Psalm. And it's a psalm of ascents, a psalm that would have been sung as the pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem to worship God for the various annual feasts in Israel of old. And the psalmist writes and says these words, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so often in the old days, mountains and hills would have had spiritual significance to uh, people who didn't know the Lord, didn't know God. And so the psalmist draws a distinction and says, whereas there are those who look to the hills and the mountains for their help and for their security, actually, we look to God. And then he qualifies it by saying that this is the one who made heaven and earth. And we have the privilege again today of drawing aside in this very simple fashion and under these unusual circumstances to offer up our praise and our worship to God and to seek to fellowship with him today and to draw near to him. And so we're going to open with a word of prayer at this point and I invite you to join with me as we say a prayer together. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we approach you today with gladness of heart and mind. And we must say to you that you have brought relief to us, that we have found you to be our help, that you, we have found you to be the source of life. And Father, we have found you to bring into our lives a measure of peace and fulfillment that we could not find in this world. And we are glad today that you have made man in your image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And Father, we are glad today for the distinction in the sexes that you have given to us. And we rejoice in your manifold wisdom demonstrated in the intricacies and the vast expanses of your creation. And as the creator and the sustainer of the heavens and the earth, we approach you today. And we should like to temper our approach with the reminder that you are the one who made the heavens and the earth, and that you are the one to whom belongs all authority and all power, and that you are the one who is all wise, the all-knowing God, and that you are the one and true God. And besides you, there is none other. All others are false, and all others lead men astray. And rightly does the proverb say that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is the way of death. The end thereof is death. But not with you. As we follow you, as we obey you, and as we draw near to you, we find that you bring us life, and life abundant. Father, that you bring into our families, into our homes, and into our experience of life a fulfillment that we could not imagine. And Father, you reach into the very deepest parts of our makeup, and there you bless us and you touch us, and you strengthen us, and you help us. And we are different people because of you, and Father, because of what you do for us and through us and in us. So we today want to approach you, Lord, in an attitude of worship. We want to ascribe greatness to you today, and we pray that it would be good that all men in all places would come to know you as you truly are. 
And so we rejoice in the proclamation of the gospel. We rejoice in every reading of your word in every place on this earth of yours. And Father, it thrills us. It thrills us greatly to know that your word is being propagated. And so today we are glad also of these moments together uh, where we also might focus our attention as a local church upon the word of God. We thank you for the number of different online platforms that we can access that make it possible for so many of our fellowship to meet together in this way at this time. And we're saddened that we cannot gather together as a church family on our premises at this time. But Lord, we want to thank you that despite that setback, we can still uh, make great efforts in meeting together more broadly. So we thank you for these many platforms that are available to us. Thank you for our AV team who works so hard to make sure that the wider congregation can be reached. And so, Lord, we want to approach you now in an attitude of worship, and we want very much, Lord, to meet with you today. We do pray that you would peel back the hardness of our hearts and the blindness of our eyes, and that you would cause us again to be confronted with just how sacred you truly are and that we would be genuinely taken up with you again today. Oh Lord, that we would come to see you as you truly are. We cannot do that in our own strength and so we ask that you would strengthen us today to draw near to you. Cause us to hold more loosely onto the things of this world and to cast aside anything that feeds our pride and that we walk, would walk humbly with you even in this service this morning. So we offer up to you our praise and our adoration and our thanks, Lord, and we bless you today for who you are and for what you have come to mean to us. The contrast in our lives is dramatic, Lord. Once we were lost and in the darkness of our own sinful ways, blinded to our need of you, and yet by your grace and through your sheer long-suffering and mercy, we have had our eyes opened to the reality of our situation. And we thank you again today for Jesus Christ, your Son. He is the Son of God. He is God. He is fully man and fully God. And we marvel at his incarnation. And yet, Lord, we're glad that Jesus Christ has come. For through his sacrifice alone can we come to know the forgiveness of our sins. So grant that we might approach you with love in our hearts for your Son today as well. And so we commend ourselves thus to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in keeping with our tradition, uh, we like to have a children's address Sunday mornings. And uh, whilst things were happening online, everything was online, we were able to maintain that. And uh, today I'm glad that Brittany's with us, and Brittany's going to come and share with us as well. Thank you, Brittany. Well, uh, good morning, boys and girls. It's good to see the few boys and girls that are at church this morning, and welcome to those of you who are watching at home as well. <clears throat> so today, um, I want to tell you that this week we had a really special day in our house because on Tuesday, Isaac and Benjamin had their birthdays, and Isaac turned four and Benjamin turned two, and to celebrate, we went to Streamvale uh, Open Farm. Now, I wonder who has been to Streamvale? Has anybody been to Streamvale? Yeah, okay, so a few people have. Um, now at Streamvale, you get to see lots of animals. You get to hold baby chicks and you get to pet goats and we saw a sheepdog uh, trial and we saw a sheep race. Um, but there was something that we had to do before we could go into Streamvale. And there was something that we had to do before we touched the animals and after we touched the animals and we had to uh, do it when we left Streamvale as well. Does anybody have a guess of what it could be, Abby? Yes, exactly. We had to wash our hands. And when we went into Streamvale, we had to use the, the hand gel, didn't we, guys, to wash our hands? And we really like the hand gel in our house, right? No, we really don't like the hand gel, okay? It's cold and it stinks, but we have to do it anyway. Although some places it does smell nice. But anyway, we had to wash our hands a lot when we were at Streamvale. And I don't have to tell you why. Everybody knows why. And it's because of this little virus here, isn't it? And uh, the coronavirus has really thrown a spanner into things and made a big problem for us. 
And, you know, when I look at my hands, I can't see any germs or any viruses on my hands, right? You know, but uh, scientists can look in a microscope and they can see the coronavirus through a really powerful microscope. And it looks something like this. I think it looks pretty gross. Victoria said she thought it looked nice, but I think it looks pretty yuck. But anyway, um, just in case the coronavirus is on our hands, we have to wash our hands and, you know, get rid of it. Because the coronavirus doesn't like soap, it doesn't like water, and it washes it away. And, you know, this is something that has affected everybody in the whole world. Isn't that amazing? And a pandemic, that word pan means whole. And so everybody in the whole world, in every country, the coronavirus has spread from person to person. So that's why we have to wash our hands so that we don't spread it around. But I wonder, this morning I want you to think about another really big problem, bigger than coronavirus. It's always been around, okay? It's a big problem that everybody in the whole world and every country who has ever been born, who will ever be born, has. And in fact, you have it from the time that you're born, this big problem. And it's actually even worse than coronavirus. Can anybody guess what it is? Does anybody know, Riley? Sin. Sin. That is right. And you know, God tells us, although you wash yourself with soap, and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Sovereign Lord. And the stain of, our, uh, the stain of your guilt is talking about our sin. And God says you can wash your hands as much as you like. You can use cleansing powder. You can use that hygiene, you know, 100%, no germs solution. And yet you'll still have the problem of sin. And Riley told us we have this problem of sin. And you know, sin is kind of like the coronavirus because we can't see it with our eyes. Okay? We, sin starts in our minds. It starts in our heart. And then it comes out in the things that we do, the things that we say. And that's how we see it. But everyone who's ever been born has this problem of sin. And there's nothing we can do to get rid of it. We can't wash it away. But you know, God loves us so much that he did make a way for our sin to be washed away. But it's not with water. It's not with soap. It's with something much more precious, much more valuable to wash our sins away. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? That's our sin, okay? Acts that lead to death is sin, so that we may serve the living God. Sorry, the living God. So what is it that cleanses us from our sins? It's the blood of Jesus. And Jesus had to die on the cross and shed his blood so that we could be washed and be made clean and be made free from sin. So I want you to remember whenever you see the hand sanitizer and whenever you're reminded to wash your hands, that that's good, we need to do it. But there's something else that is even more important for us to do is to be washed in Jesus' blood and be forgiven by Jesus. And all that means is that you say, I believe, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And then you're washed and you're free from your sins. So will you remember that? That we need to be washed from our sins as well as wash our hands. Okay, thanks for listening so well. Well, Brittany, thank you for sharing with us this morning. It's, uh, I imagine, uh, not just the easiest sharing under these circumstances. Normally, we have the children up with us around the front, and it's a little easier to engage in that way. It's a little more tricky 
as things stand at the moment. But thank you, thank you for braving those choppy waters. Uh, Brittany, we appreciate that, my dear. And thanks for listening so well as well to all our young folk. I have a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you this morning, if I may. I have, uh, first of all, a card of thanks from Robin and Hannah Cahoon. And let me just read this for you, if I may. Um, they would like to just express uh, their appreciation to the, the wider fellowship uh, for all that uh, they have been on the receiving end of. Um, so to Paul, Jackie, and to Straight Church, thank you so much to our church family for all your prayers, phone calls, texts, doorstep visits, and cards over the recent months. Thank you also to all who ran errands, collected shopping, and fed us like royalty over this hard time. Robin really appreciated the people who took time to phone, video call, and message him in hospital and at home. Please continue to remember us all in prayer, and more than ever, we would really appreciate the continued support and calls. Life for our family has certainly changed, and as we adapt, we know the Lord is with us, holding us in his loving arms. We love and miss each and every one of you. Much love and prayers from Robin, Hannah, and Rory. And she quotes 2 Timothy 4 and 17, but the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. So it's wonderful to uh, be a part of a local church. There are all sorts of reasons that um, it's good for us to be connected with our local church. And um, a really good, deep connection with the local church is really what God has in mind for Christians and so that we can grow and develop. But when crisis comes, as it does so often to families, um, that we have a network around us that we can fall back on and rely upon uh, to know that there are folk who are caring, praying, supporting, loving, and being kind means so much, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. And so the Lord comforts us through other people so that when our turn comes, we in turn can be a comfort to those who are also in need. Just some further announcements as well. Again, just a thank you to our AV team for their hard work over this past week in making sure everything was up on the website and the DVDs were available as well. A reminder of the prayer meeting this Wednesday coming at, at 8 o'clock in the evening. And again, just to make you understand the rationale behind the move from a Thursday to a Wednesday is that we could increase the gap between services on our church premises to beyond a 72-hour mark. Um, that figure, uh, while there is some controversy around it, it is the figure that is being used by the Northern Ireland office. And so that has been used as a guide. And so to make sure that we're outside of the premises uh, and that there's at least a 72-hour gap between services, this is the, the thinking there. Um, please do remember as well that for the, the purposes of contact tracing, if in the unfortunate event of a coronavirus outbreak within our own local church, uh, we do practice contact tracing, and so uh, a register is kept of folk who attend our church services. Now, just uh, to let you know that this is not obligatory, and if you're not comfortable with us recording your presence on at our worship services, you are more than uh, um, you're well within your rights to ask us to remove your name from that list. So please, folks, please don't feel uncomfortable about that or, or feel that uh, we will in, in, interpret that as being difficult. And um, we're very happy to comply with your wishes. So please, if that is an issue for you, please let us know and we will do all the necessary as well. Of course, that doesn't apply to people who are watching this online, okay? You're okay. You can just relax. We're not keeping you guys on a register either. Uh, as far as the offering plates are concerned, just again a reminder that the offering plates are now at the rear of our church hall, and uh, you can make use of those on your way in or on your way out of the services. We won't be lifting offering and going around the congregation. The stewards won't be doing that uh, for the foreseeable future. And again, on a practical note, just later as we exit the service, um, we, we're asking that we don't just uh, all exit simultaneously in mass and crowd around the exits. Um, one of the deacons or two of the deacons um, will, will just uh, very graciously uh, give you the nod, and that will be your cue to then stand and leave. And we'll probably just file out from the back of the hall as we did last week. So that, that kind of will be our practice, and that'll be the new norm for us. And just an update for you as well regarding Rosetta Finley. Many of you will know that Rosetta is in hospital. She was admitted on uh, Friday past a week ago. Uh, Rosetta has been unwell with pancreatitis. Uh, this has been giving her a tremendous amount of difficulty. And then Friday past a week ago, uh, when the day she was admitted, she fell at home and she has broken ribs and she has also punctured one of her lungs. And so on top of the, uh, the, the poor health uh, that, that sort of started this uh, last episode for her, she now has this further complication. So drains are having to be fitted and then moved as well. And the pain associated with that is uh, 
excruciating. So please just do remember to pray for her. And they won't allow her home until she's strong enough to actually stand and walk by herself. And she's not anywhere near that at this stage. She has lost so much weight and she is so weak uh, and so poorly. So it'd be great if we can just remember her. And remember Jeffrey as well and Rosetta's sister, Grace, who is from Conlock and is currently caring for things on the home front here in Strait. Be great to remember that. And also just uh, an update for you regarding Michael and Julie Chitty. Uh, the Chitties were, had planned to return uh, to Northern Ireland in August time. And then yesterday it was announced that Spain uh, is now one of those destinations from which when people return to Northern Ireland, they are going to have to automatically self-quarantine for two weeks. And so this has thrown their travel plans completely up in the air. And as a family, they're sort of scrambling, trying to recover any funds on tickets that they've already spent and then make alternative arrangements as well. And so uh, we've been in contact with them this morning and they're asking that we just kindly remember to pray for them. Um, on a bit of a brighter note, uh, I got word last night from Nigel Wilson. Nigel is, uh, was giving feedback regarding the outreach in which he is involved in Newquay and a couple of other places down in Cornwall. And he is saying that from the open air work that they're involved in, in Newquay in particular, they're getting a tremendous uh, amount of response from individuals, uh, shop people working in shops, um, people with just all sorts of different backgrounds who've been approaching them and asking for literature and uh, actually asking for Nigel and the uh, New Key Baptist Church pastor, George, and George and Nigel uh, approaching them and asking them to pray for them and, uh, and for their particular difficult situations that they are having. And so lots of people with lots of problems. And, uh, and, and so we just trust that God will uh, continue to use them and continue to use all uh, the church in the UK uh, at this time of difficulty to be a help and a blessing to those around us who really are blinded to their need of Christ, and we are the torchbearers, and, uh, and may God help us to be faithful to him in that regard as well. So, those are the announcements as I have them this morning. We're going to turn now to the Word of God for the remainder of our service, and can I encourage you to turn with me quickly to the book of Genesis in chapter 22. We continue to uh, look into the life of this tremendous Old Testament patriarch, Abraham, this wonderful, wonderful man who... Um, really marked the beginning of God's great plan of redemption in terms of hu human agents. And um, we have the privilege this morning again of looking at Scripture together. So let me encourage you to turn to Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to read from verse 1. Uh, the man who the Scriptures describe as the friend of God. Um, and it just raises uh, incredible possibilities that God would embrace a man to himself and call him his friend. Um, what, a, what a privileged relationship to be in uh, for Abraham at that time, but how much more privileged for the church in the New Testament age, which is the body of Christ and actually part of the very family of God, sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So uh, Genesis chapter 22 and reading from verse 1, and again, this is the word of God. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told Abraham. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! Exclamation mark there. Don't lose that. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By my swat, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Amen. What a precious portion of Scripture that we can share together like this today. Let's just take a moment to pray together as we think about the Word of God. Let's just pray. So, Father, we are so glad today again of the option and the ability to read the Scriptures and to immerse ourselves in Your Word. And we know that Your Word is truth. And we know also that Your Word is eternal. And we know that Your Word also will outlast even the very creation around us, O God. And so we thank You that You have uh, given us insight into these communications, these sacred communications, and that You've given us the uh, Lord, the privilege of, of peeking into this relationship that you had with this man Abraham so long ago and for helping us to see how God-fearing he was, to help us to see what a giant this man really was and to understand why it is that you chose him to be the starting point of your great, point of re your great uh, redemption narrative. And we thank you that we have this man Abraham to look back to and we thank you that the Scriptures speak so highly of him. And we thank you that the, the example we have in this man, despite the fact that he was imperfect, we have in this man an example, and we have tremendous quality, uh, uh, qualities and character traits, Lord, that are so venerable and, and that we ought to aspire to. We thank you that it opens up also for us the potential of relationship with God, that what God can do in the life of one man, God can do in the life of another. And the relationship that one man can have with God, so too can another man. And this encourages us today, Lord, as we think about our own relationships with you and how that we, Lord, there is more ground to be gained. There is more fellow ground in our souls that needs to be plowed and sowed so that we may be more productive and fruitful and, Lord, bring more glory to you and make more of an impact for the kingdom of God with the time that you have allotted to us. So, Father, this morning we pray that by your Spirit you will penetrate our hearts and minds and that the truth of your, Lord, your Word will distill upon our hearts and that you will awaken in us, Lord, a hungering and a thirsting for God, that we want more of you in our lives, that we wouldn't sit back on our laurels and be content with the progress that we have made hitherto. Lord, may we aspire to greater heights with you, greater acts of service, a greater godliness within our own makeup, we pray. So, Lord, we offer ourselves to you this morning as a, as a blank a canvas. Come this morning by your Spirit and, and make something beautiful out of this service. And, Lord, make something beautiful take place in our lives today so that we would be different and you would be glorified and that attention would be drawn ultimately to you through our efforts and our lives. Father, we are glad that we can be a church that prays for one another, that we can be mindful of those who are in difficulty. And we offer up to you again our prayers, Lord, our loving prayers for those of our church who are in difficulty. We think of families where there is bereavement, where great loss has come. 
and where deep hurt has been sustained. And we, Lord, pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will graciously pour out and dispense healing and, 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 and calm, and that you would bring soothing, Lord, that you assuage grief as only you can, and that you will help your dear children as they fumble and stumble with the after effects of all that has taken place in their lives. We think of many who are unwell physically and their bodies are weakened, and Lord, there are health problems and difficulties, and, and for some the prognosis is, is scary, and we do pray for these as well, that you would graciously draw near and undertake for them and help them. Pray too for homes today where there is sadness, Lord. And sometimes our sadness leaves us speechless, Lord. And we cannot even articulate prayers properly because we're numb with hurt and fear. And we are glad that we can remember homes to you before you today where, again, that loving, gracious, gentle presence of God would draw near and that you would bring light where there is darkness and where the clouds have rolled in overhead, Lord, and there is just no prospect of blue skies, we pray that you would today, even just now, draw very near and help, Lord, for we are weak. We are creatures of the dust, and we smart badly at times, and so we pray, draw near to us and help us. Continue with us for these closing moments together now as we, again, give ourselves to reflecting on your word, to study your word. Be to us all that we need. Give us understanding beyond our normal and academic faculties and prowess. Bless us, we pray you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so as we think about Abraham, this dear man who is such a giant in the word of God and is esteemed and revered across the face of the earth like few men ever, ever in the history of this world has a man been so revered as Abraham. The entire Muslim world reveres him. Christendom reveres him. Judaism reveres him. There are few men that have walked the earth as Abraham. And so we have the privilege again of just thinking about this test that God gave to him, this incredible, this monstrous test this astonishing test, this horrendous test. I wouldn't like to be the focus of a test like this. I'm sure you wouldn't either. But God, we're told, comes to him and that God tested Abraham. And of course, this little word test, astonishing as it is, points to a divine agenda, that there is a divine purpose that is playing itself out here, that God isn't just arbitrarily or randomly throwing this man a test to see, well, we'll see how he handles this today. Okay, God has an agenda. God is working according to a schedule, okay? And that schedule culminates ultimately with the glorious return of Jesus Christ to this earth where he will be revered and perceived as Lord of all, right? That's the end point. But this is the start of the journey, okay? This is the front of the journey, all right? So it starts with Abraham and ultimately culminates with the Lord Jesus Christ. So God tests him. There is purpose. There's an objective here. And the fact that it's a test as well suggests to us that, that God would be present with him through this ordeal. God is going to be with him through this process. Okay, so there's purpose, and there is the presence of God with him, that God is uh, working uh, according to a, a, a plan that he has in his own mind. And, uh, and so let me just say to you that the language that is used here is heavy with divine intent, and this completely just brushes aside any notion of, of some sort of an arbitrary intervention on the part of God in Abraham's life, in this patriarch's life. And... Um, uh, okay, and, and I think the fact that divine precedent has been set for Abraham already in, in the incident when he banished Ishmael and Hagar from the home, remember at that stage there was that sort of intervention at the last minute where God stepped in and really saved Ishmael's life and Hagar's life, right? They would have died. I mean, being banished into the desert is a death sentence. And, and perhaps with that in mind, as he, as he leaves to go down the road, there is a, a wonder, you wonder to what extent there was a suspicion in his own life, in his own heart, that God was going to miraculously help again in this instance. 
And so let's have a look at his response. Now, look at his response in verse 3. Okay, so verse 3 through to verse 8 roughly is, is kind of the journey. And uh, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And we'll just stop at that point there in verse 3. Now, let's be honest here. If we hadn't been surprised by the test that God had given to him that's made obvious to him in, in verse 1 and 2, if that didn't surprise us, surely, surely Abraham's response is going to surprise us. We can more easily identify with Abraham's response than we can with God's command, right? His, his response is astonishing. It really is astonishing. Look at verse 3. He, aro- he rose early in the morning. He's been told, take your son down the road and commit an act of immolation. That's burn him, burn your son. And the very next morning, he's up first thing, crack of dawn. Down the road he goes. Abraham arose early in the morning. An astonishing response, and it stands really in stark contrast to Abraham's protests earlier with God in chapter 18. Have a look with me quickly in chapter 18. And then uh, let's have a look at verse 22 in particular. And of course, the content here is that God has dispatched his angels, okay? The angel of the Lord has come along with two other angels, and they are going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to blow the place apart. They're going to completely ruin and destroy the whole place, right? So in chapter 18 and verse 22, look at what Abraham says, right? Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? His keen sense of justice and his his abhorrence at injustice triggers him to, to speak out. How can you do this? Look at verse 23. Say, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Verse 24. So suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Notice how he engages with God, and there is such strong protest with God, and he cites God's own characteristics, God's own character traits, as the basis for his engaging with God and for his protestations. Lord, you can't do this. You're righteous. How can you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? How can you make no distinction between the godly and the ungodly and just destroy all around you? How can you do that? Shall not the judge of all the earth do that which is right? Lord, you know better than that. You know, Lord, it's not right. You can't dish out to the righteous that which is reserved for the unrighteous. Lord, how can you do that? And that's the gist of what's going on here in chapter 18. And so it's astonishing that when we come to his own son and God calls on him to sacrifice his own boy, that Abraham doesn't murmur a single word. Not a word, not a, not a protest. And it's unbelievable. It's It's It's, it's astonishing. How do we account for that? This man who was accustomed to engaging with God and to, as it were, wrestling with God in a a, a, a verbal engagement, he was prepared to do that in chapter 18. But, But when it comes to his own son, there's not a word said. Astonishing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It appears that the the fact that there were 50 righteous, that's how he began his argument with God in, in his protesting with God in chapter 18 there. You know, it, it, it appears that from Abraham's perspective, the 50 righteous that he initially mentioned who were present in the city, he felt as if it gave him leverage. It gave him leverage to, to bargain with God, right? It gave him leverage. Lord, you, you, you can't do this because, you know, the righteous people, you can't do that. These 50 righteous, he said, didn't deserve to die, didn't deserve the judgment that was coming. They didn't deserve to die with the wicked, right? But in the case of his, his own son, in the case of Isaac, there was only one person to work with, okay? He started with 50, 
because he didn't know. He just guessed, sucked his thumb, and said, well, let's imagine there's 50 righteous people in the city. But when it came to his own boy, do you notice he has no leverage? He has no leverage. There's only one. And, you know, this, perhaps this awful realization came to him that really he was in no position to bargain with God. What could he say? What could he say? Take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, take him and go. What do you say to that? And so he is desperately quiet at that point. And, and meekly, humbly, obediently rises the next morning. and makes preparations. Abram's response to God at this point gives the impression that for Abraham it was, it was proper for him to assume that it was appropriate, that it was acceptable, and it was normal almost for God to, to ask for a human sacrifice. And I think this suggests to us, and, and the, you know, other, other records will bear this out, that the, the human sacrifice was, was, was common practice in Canaan. That's what people did. And you know, special circumstances, such as you know, the dedication of a new building, or when dire, a dire emergency descended on, on a community, on, on a, on a city-state, or during a time of siege, when a city was under siege, or when you know, a plague or a pestilence or locusts or something like that had come through or, or some other you know, similar calamity was facing communities, uh, on those occasions it was common practice for families to make a sacrifice of their children. Abraham was aware of this. This is what was going on around him. And so when God came and told him to do the very thing, it's not like he'd never heard of this before. This was common practice. And so his response suggests that he, well, this is how we do things. This is just how it is. So we see him embrace this incredible command, this monstrous command that God gives to him. So they, they begin the journey. Now, what is interesting as we read through the narrative here, and, and just you know, bearing in mind that Abraham and Isaac, at least Abraham and Sarah, were way past the age of, well, Sarah was way past the age of childbearing, right? I mean, she was coming 90, and I think she was about 90, 91 when Isaac was born, okay? She was way past childbearing age by a country mile, and, and God gives to this barren elderly couple a little boy, and his name means laughter because now the sadness and the grief associated with the barrenness for their whole married life is turned on its head but at the, very, at the very latter end of their lives. And so Isaac's name means laughter. And, and it seems slightly out of character for Sarah to be completely outside of the loop, as, as the record you know, seems to indicate, right? She very featured obviously very heavily at his birth, but the Spirit of God has kept silent regarding the mother in the lead up to Isaac's immolation. There's been, you know, where was Sarah in all of this? Not a, not a complaint from the mother. Well, the astonishment in regard to Sarah's silence or the absence of any kind of uh, you know, response from Sarah in, in regard to this, all right, uh, has, has evoked such astonishment that e in Jewish tradition, you know, there's, there's a story, that, there's a story that where, where it's said that she uttered, when she came to hear of what God was asking, that, or God was commanding that she uttered six shrieks in a row, and then she died. She died at that time after she heard this. But of course, that's, that's recorded in Jewish tradition, and, and it's not in the Bible, so we're not holding any, putting any stock in that necessarily, but it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting that God doesn't give us an indication about the mother's response. Can you imagine the row in that home? the night before? You're going to take my boy, whose name means laughter, and on whom all of God's promises to you rest on this child. You're going to take him and go and burn him? 
God is silent and says nothing to us and retains that for himself. Why did Abraham react as he did in verse 3? Rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, split the wood for the burnt offering, rose and went to the place God of which God had told him. All of that in verse 3. How do we account for this? Well, perhaps the best way to understand what was going on inside Abraham's own life, to understand the inner workings of his own heart, is to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 17. And Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, we are given a tremendous insight by the writer to the Hebrews. The author has given us tremendous insight, a window into the soul and the mind of Abraham at that time. And there we're told, and reading from the New Living Translation, it says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. I love that. It tells us there partway through verse 17 that he was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac at the end of verse 17. He was ready to do it. Despite the fact that he knew that the future promises relating to his progeny centered on Isaac. Everything, all the promises God had given to him centered and focused on Isaac. And so when God said to him, take this child and I want you to make a sacrifice of him, how did he respond? Look at verse 19. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. And there is the key in verse 19. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. You see, and, and, and the entire episode was characterized by Abraham operating by faith. Operating by faith. He wasn't operating by his own sight and his own feelings. Those weren't driving him. He rose early in the morning, and he took his donkey, and he took the young men, and he took the firewood, and he took the fire, and he traveled for three days, listening to the sound of his footfalls and those of his boy and the donkey behind them and the boys, listening for, to footfalls for three days. And he did that, and he saw the journey to its end because he was operating by faith. That was the overriding principle in his life at that time. And the reason that his faith was so robust and ensured that he was able to stay true to God, even under the most brutal of circumstances, in the face of the most monstrous command that God ever gave to a man, it was because he reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. This word reasoned that is used here in the... Uh, New Living Translation, translated a little differently in some of the other English translations. But this word reasoned comes from a Greek word, logizomai, logizomai. And this is the, the, the root word that we get our English words logic or logical from. And this word logizomai means to take into account or to, to reason through something and come to a logical conclusion. And when we do that, when we reason through something using logic and we're able to come to a logical conclusion, that best positions someone to be able to make a correct decision, right? When you understand the facts and you are logical as you work through the facts, you are best positioned to make a correct decision. And so that's how the word is used of Abraham regarding the, the, the immolation of Isaac, right? He took into account 
the promises that God had given him regarding Isaac. And, and interestingly, God repeats uh, some of those promises uh, towards the end of the narrative, and then he builds onto them as well, right? Look at verse 17 of chapter 22, where God talks about blessing him and multiplying him so that his descendants would be as the stars of their heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, all right? Okay, now that's just a repetition of what God has already said. And it is God's word, you see, it is God's word that played into Abraham's response. The reason that he was able to rise early in the morning, the reason he was able to do something that you and I look at today and say, I could never do that. I could never serve God like that. I could never be a missionary. I could never be a preacher. I could never be a pastor. I could never be a godly young man or a godly young woman. We look at these obstacles and we look at these challenges and, and we look at things that other people can do and we say, well, I could never be like that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. See, the difference is, we like Abraham, we have got to reason with ourselves. That's what Abraham did at this time. He reasoned in his own heart and mind. He looked at the promises that God had already given him, the promise that God, through this child, Isaac, would make his descendants in the future to be and to number as many as the stars in the night sky and now as the sand on the seashore. Abraham looked at the promises that God had given to him in regard to Isaac, and with those promises in mind... Even though what God was telling him to do didn't make sense, and even though what God was calling him to do looked as if it was going against what God's greater plan was, it left him in a position where he could entrust himself and entrust his child and entrust his circumstances to God because God had already given him promises. God had already given him reassurances that he would be with him that he would sustain him, that through Isaac he would have descendants that wouldn't be beyond counting. And this is what the writer to the Hebrews is telling us. Abraham reasoned. Abraham looked at the facts. He looked at God's promises. He looked at God's word and he said, well, God has said that through this boy I'm going to have descendants that will number the stars in the night sky. Through this boy uh, I am going to have descendants that will number as the sand on the seashore. Through this boy, God says, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed at some point down the road. Therefore, I conclude that if God takes this boy and I do put him and I do sacrifice him, I do burn him, even if I do that, God's going to have to bring him back to life. Because if God doesn't bring him back to life, then God's promises are not worth spit. And that released him. That, that set him free to do the most unbelievable thing that God could ever call a man to do, a woman to do. Having our faith resting on the unshakable word of God. That, ladies and gentlemen, and dear young people, is what living by faith is all about. It is reasoning that if God has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always... Well, if that's what God says, well then, hey, let me get on board. And even if people do reject the gospel, and even if people do reject me because I'm bringing the Lord Jesus Christ and wanting to share Christ with them, that's fine. Because you know what? He is with me. He is with me. And like Jesus taught about the parables of the different kind of soil, right? We always talk about the four soil. There's, there's more than four types. There's about six types of soil. But in that parable, didn't Jesus say, listen, yeah, you're going to have hard ground, and you're going to have rocky ground, and you're going to have thorny ground, but you're going to have good ground too. So you know what? Get out there. Share the gospel. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell them about Jesus. Tell people about Christ. Be tasteful. 
Be diplomatic. Don't be bombastic. And you know the way some people can just be a little bit too much with things, right? But tell people about Jesus, right? And what, is, what has Jesus said himself? He says, listen, I will be with you. When you talk to your friends at school, when school gets going again at some point, okay, when you talk to your friends and your colleagues at work, when you talk about Christ, when you share the gospel, Jesus himself has said, I will be with you. And we need to hold on to that. And Abraham held on to the fact of the promise that even if he did make the sacrifice and he followed through and there was no divine intervention before the fatal blow, Abraham had reason that even if Isaac had died, God was able to bring him back to life again. He's going to have to because of the promises he'd already given. And that is what makes this man so incredible. It wasn't his physical prowess. It wasn't his academic record. It wasn't his wealth. It was his faith in God. And God identified him as my friend. The friend of God. Folks, let me tell you. We can pursue money, and we can pursue career, and we can pursue all the trappings that this world has to offer us, all the fun experiences the world has to offer, and there are many experiences the world has to offer, but I guarantee you now, I, I tell you now, they will not bring you an ounce of peace. They will not resolve and massage your disquieted conscience in your chest. They will not bring you peace of heart and mind. Oh, they'll bring you fun. And I'm not saying don't have fun, right? I'm not against fun, okay? But I am against us Christians making things and money and experiences and holidays and all these wonderful things when those things replace God in our lives. That's a problem. Then they're idols. Anything that draws you away from God, that pulls your focus away from God, is a curse. It doesn't matter how nice it is. It doesn't matter how good it is. And don't let the devil fool you into thinking that you can have a fulfilled life and you can sort of dip in and out of church, do a bit of Christianity, but for the most part, just live your life the way you want to. You rob yourself and you will know nothing of the heights, the sublime heights of walking with God and knowing the presence of God and the fulfillment and the satisfaction that God can give you. It's not about money and it's not about experiences. It's not about property. It's not about uh, the mortgage. It's about God and it's about walking with God and it's about trusting God and it's about knowing God and it's about fearing God. And we see these things in the life of Abraham prepared even to go as far as giving his boy and burning his son's body on a fire because he believed that even if he did that, God would still bring this boy back to life. And this is what we're aiming for. This trust, this implicit trust, belief in God, taking him at his word. This glorifies God most. This brings glory to God in ways that you and I can't even begin to imagine. And we haven't even got yet to the benefits that this has on those around us. The impact that Abraham has had. We are here today, and we have a gospel message today because of what this man did then. We feel the benefit of his obedience and faith so long ago. We feel that today. May God help you and I, each one, each one, young and old, to be great people of faith. Great faith in God so that we can do wonderful things for him in our day and age. Amen. Folks, we're going to close in a word of prayer. And after that, we're going to make our way home. And I ask again that you just remember that the stewards will usher us out appropriately. It's lovely to see you all. I can't see everyone at home, but it is lovely to know that you're there. And we do trust that God will help us each one in this day and age as we want to live for him and even under these adverse circumstances to make an impact for his name's sake in this world around us. Amen. Let's just close together in a word of prayer.
Father, we thank you for the life of Abraham. We thank you for the record we have and for the insights that are given to us about the inner workings of his heart, of his robust faith in God, his implicit trust in your word. And Lord, he took you at your word and he acted out on those promises that you gave to him. And even despite a monstrous command as, as this was, Lord, he was able to follow through and obey and honor you. And Lord, we want, to, uh, we want to have that kind of faith and trust in you as well. Lord, we also want to make our lives count for the sake of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want our lives to be used for your glory. And we pray that you will help us in these days to take gentle baby steps, even if necessary, but to develop our faith and to increasingly, Lord, come to that point where we fear you, not in the sense of trembling in our boots like we're scared of, of a scary movie, but where we revere you so much, Lord. We, we respect you and honor you so much that there is nothing that we wouldn't do that you would call us to do. So help us to take these lessons to heart. Help us, Lord, to uh, really come away from the service today with something that is meaningful to us, each one, uh, personal, and, and that will be a help to us, an encouragement for us, and a, and, a, and a prod to push us forward in our relationship with you. We pray you. Support us with your wonderful blessing, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, bless you all, and have a wonderful week, and be safe.